praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt the name of the Lord together. Welcome to the Katie Geneva Cannon Center for Womanist Leadership Virtual Spring Conference 2021 Morning Glory Worship Service. Womanist Worship 
is where there is freedom of expression of black women's spirituality. And I know you are looking forward to the Howard Gospel Choir and Reverend Mia McLean to bless us. And most importantly, the preacher of the hour is none other than Reverend Dr. Renita J. Wings. Before we start this morning, i like for us to join together in prayer. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We have gathered all over the world, from parts in the United States to even parts of South America, we have gathered as community, virtually women all across the globe. We've come from different backgrounds, different social locations, different heritage, different experiences, and even different religious traditions. But what binds us and what brings us closer together is the spirit. We love the spirit. God, we come before you today recognizing that our community, our world has endured great struggle. The year of 2020 and 2021, so many lives have been lost, more than 500,000 to the coronavirus. And even on top of that, We've had to deal with struggle upon struggle against black lives in America, struggle upon struggle against violence against our Asian brothers and sisters, struggle upon struggle as gun violence continues to rise in this nation. But Lord, our trust is in you and you alone. If anyone, anyone, can bring us out of this, it is you and you alone. So God, right now, through this service, we ask that you will touch, heal, deliver in every way that only you can. Go into every home, every altar space, every sanctuary, every place where we are and meet us. As Hagar said, let the God who sees us, let us see God. And we will be careful always to give your name glory and to give you honor. In your name, amen. Founded in the fall of 1968 by Melanie Russell Lee and Rosalind Tompkins Lynch, the Howard Gospel Choir, also known as HGC, is the first collegiate choir of its kind in the world. As a result, HGC has pioneered an international legacy in gospel music ministry. With an active roster of 70 plus persons that consists of students and alumni from Howard University, as well as others from the surrounding community, the choir is one of the largest religious life organizations on campus, operating under the historic Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel. The Dean of the Chapel, the Reverend Dr. Bernard Richardson, serves as the choir's advisor. In addition to distinguished professionals in every imaginable discipline, past members of this award-winning ensemble include Grammy Award winners Richard Smallwood, Corey Carton, and Elbernita Twinkie Clark of the legendary Clark Sisters, as well as R&B star Angela Winbush. Exceptional musicians have always been instrumental in shaping HGC's unique sound to embrace both contemporary and traditional gospel, church hymns, Negro spirituals, and classically arranged anthems. For 25 years, the late Arphilius Paul Gatling Jr. served as the musical director. He is largely responsible for crafting the unique sound of the choir. For almost five decades, the Howard Gospel Choir has set a very high standard as a premier performing arts ensemble, singing at a wide variety of venues in and around the greater Washington, D.C. metropolitan area including the White House, the Capitol Building, Dar Constitutional Hall, Washington National Cathedral, and the Smithsonian Museum of American History. In 2016, the choir released their latest full-length album entitled Glorious God, 
available online at www.howardgospelchoir.com slash gloriousgod and on all digital platforms. The CD is a diverse collective of musical offerings that reflect their musical legacy. In addition to remaining on the top 30 charts for national sales and radio airplay and gospel music for more than 10 weeks, this critically acclaimed album was nominated for two 2017 Stellar Awards, four Rhythm of Gospel Awards, and a Steeple Award. From the outset, the Howard Gospel Choir has been in constant demand and has been blessed to share the stage with a number of musical luminaries, including Barry Manilow, Tony Bennett, Stevie Wonder, Fantasia, and Patti LaBelle. Additionally, HGC has performed at functions that have featured prominent political, religious, and public figures such as President Barack Hussein Obama, Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., the Reverend Jesse Jackson, and the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright Jr. Notwithstanding the legacy of excellence and the vast accomplishments since its inception, the main objective remains the same, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ through song. Our purpose and passion is to serve Christ with our musical gifts, bringing peace, restoration, healing, and inspiration to all who lend their ears and hearts. The choir is currently under the musical direction of Reginald Golden, a Howard University graduate from University Heights, Ohio. Daryl Brown, also a Howard University alumnus, is the assistant director. Hello, my name is Reginald Golden, and I proudly serve as the music director of the Howard Gospel Choir of Howard University. Union Presbyterian Seminary, we are honored to join you for this year's Katie Geneva Cannon Center for Womenist Leadership Spring Conference. And would like to take this opportunity to thank Reverend Melanie Jones and the entire conference planning committee for extending toward us such a gracious invitation. Be blessed and be a blessing. The soldier says, Thine, O Lord, is greatness, power, and glory. Thine, O Lord, is victory and all the majesty. Oh, thine, O Lord, all the honor belongs to you, God. Everything in heaven and on earth belongs to our God. Any promise? Paul said it, Romans. For my reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory he promised he would reveal in our lives. Every situation under your eye, under your control, because everything in heaven. And the power and the glory forever and ever and ever, yeah. He is the glorious God, yeah, yeah. So that's why we came all the way from Washington, D.C. Hey, just to declare that we love our glorious God. Hey, holly, hallelujah. Hey, shower down. Send your power, Lord, and your glory. Fill us. Fill us. Fill us. Fill us. 
with your spirit, show your glory, sing it, oh God, shine, show it out, sing your power, we need you to fill us with your precious Holy Spirit, show your glory, oh God, you are, hey, hey, hallelujah, you're glorious, there's nobody like you, cause you're glorious. He's the king of the ages, you are. You're the God hey, who sent your son to die on a tree for you and for me. Hey, God reigns forever. He's the king of the ages, you are. Put a diesel on my man, and it won't be very long. You're gonna look for me, and he would have called us to meet him in the sky. He's a glorious God. a biblical scholar, a minister, and an author whose scholarly insights into modern faith, biblical texts, and the role of spirituality in everyday lives has made her a highly sought after writer and speaker for more than four decades. She has numerous books, commentaries, and articles on the Bible and prophetic religion to her credit. Among these are Just a Sister Away and her award-winning Listening for God, a minister's journey through silence and doubt, which won the Religious Communicators Council's prestigious Wilbur Award for excellence in communicating spiritual values to the secular media. After earning her Master of Divinity from Princeton Seminary in 1983, and a year later being ordained an elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, she earned a PhD degree at Princeton Seminary in 1989 making her the first African-American woman to earn a doctorate in Old Testament studies. Her distinguished career as a professor, administrator, clergywoman, and author continues to offer encouragement and empowerment to women and men of all backgrounds, but especially to women of color. Dr. Weems' dissertation was a trailblazing effort. Writing in an era when women doctoral students hesitated to take on women issue topics, and when most male faculty still felt uncertain, if not uncomfortable, advising such topics, Dr. Wings chose to study marriage imagery in the Hebrew prophets. Her work offered careful, challenging, and often painful insights into the use of this metaphor. Moving beyond traditional scholarship, which had all too easily looked only at the love side of marriage metaphor, Wings was among the first to point to the violence associated with this biblical imagery violence acceptable within the prophet's cultural assumptions about marriage, and all too often considered acceptable even in 20th century America. Her 1995 volume, Battered Love, Marriage, Sex, and Violence in the Hebrew Prophets, brought this important work to a wide audience, with powerful hermeneutical reflection on implications for contemporary understanding of God and marriage. Just a Sister of Way, a womanist vision of women's relationships in the Bible, published in 1989, along with a host of other articles and books highlighting the ways black women read the Bible, has sealed her legacy as trailblazer in the field of womanist biblical scholar. Dr. Weems taught in the Divinity School at Vanderbilt University from 1987 to 2004. She has served as the William and Camille Cosby Visiting Professor of Humanities at Spelman College and Vice President of Academic Affairs at American Baptist College in Nashville. In 2008, Dr. Weems became the first African-American woman to 
to deliver the Yale University Lyman Beecher Lecture. These days, Dr. Weems is enjoying semi-retirement. Even though semi-retirement often doesn't feel semi, nor to any degree like a retirement, when one considers that her time is divided between assisting her husband, Reverend Martin Espinoza, in ministry at Ray of Hope Community Church in Nashville, and juggling various writing projects, such as a memoir, a commentary, blogging for online publications, writing Bible study lessons for Christian publication, and talking with others on Twitter about the news of the day. She is happy to report that quilting and riding her bicycle are two favorite pastimes that give her reprieve from the demands of ministry, academia, and writing. Rise above, rise above. 
Well, the future is womanist, and I'm all about that future, and I'm all about that womanist, and I'm even all about that. Katie Geneva Cannon, Center for Womanist Leadership. I greet you and I am delighted for this invitation. I wanna thank the planners and the organizers for this virtual experience and the tremendous work you have done in pulling together this conference and the many uh, sisters and brothers who have joined us for this morning glory. I wanna also thank my colleague, my uh, my my uh, brother from uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, your president, Dr. Brian Blunt. We were seminarians together. We were graduate students together there at Princeton many, many years ago, and I salute him for the, his commitment to continue the legacy of Dr. Cannon and to do it excellently. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for our history together. Also, I want to thank the president and the uh, faculty and the board of trust for their excellent choice in selecting Reverend Melanie Jones as the director of the Cannon Center. It was an excellent choice. Excellent choice because this is an emerging voice in womanist ethics. But she's a sassy, she's already a sassy womanist, a millennial womanist uh, who is teaching, who teaches this, this boomer all the time and a few Gen Z's that I know about as well about uh, 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 the, what is the intersection of popular culture and womanist epistemology. But what I really want to commend, and I think it is appropriate for me at this stage in my career to be able to say about a young woman like Melanie, who I am confident Katie would have been extremely proud of, just roarious, roarously laughing proud of in that Katie Cannon way, uh, is that um, Melanie has this uncanny ability to bridge generations and to move in and out of intergenerational discourses without disruption and without drama. Her uncanny ability uh, to work with women from all kinds of, and all different backgrounds and all different kinds of discourses. Her ability certainly uh, to sit under trees she didn't plant and enjoy their shade without feeling the need to prune, replant, or harm the tree. Melanie Jones. Her ability to build on foundations she didn't plant or she didn't lay without feeling necess it necessary to tear down the plant or the building in order to make room so that she could get a better view. She is, as my mama would say, an old soul. She been here before. She got good home training that Reverend Melanie Jones. And thank you, Mrs. Jones. You have heard that woman's work is never done. Woman's work, excuse me, a woman's work is never done. And I say unto you today, woman's work is never done. As long as white heteronormative patriarchy is ubiquitous, there will be work enough for all of us to do. And those of us who are Bible scholars, woman's biblical scholars, women, women's biblical hermeneutics, if you will. Our work of reading the Bible through the lens of black women's experiences unapologetically and, and unashamedly to read biblical stories and let biblical stories read us. To read the stories and read people who read stories as well to read the stories and to know how to resist the toxic interpretations, as well as perhaps even the toxic, toxicity sometimes that is embedded there within the text. We are the interpreters and we are storytellers and there's nothing like a good story. Our lives are enriched by stories but stories do not always immediately yield 
their meaning to us. Sometimes we have to query the story. So I will say to you and admit that the story that I'm, I invite you to join with me with this morning glory is a story, uh, is the story of a woman I had unapologetically, no, ashamedly, yes, unapologetically, had never visited before in all my years of being a scholar of the Bible, in all of my years of writing about women in the Bible, I never mentioned this woman before. I've mentioned her colleagues, her, uh, uh, I've mentioned Hulda, but I've not mentioned her. I've mentioned her counterpart, but I've not mentioned her. The witch of Endor. As long as black women continue to find the Bible to be the word of God, we will need to bring to black women's attention why they need and why and how God speaks to us even through stories that those who are in authority have deemed as problematic. Because one might ask, what's a good Pentecostal, ex-Pentecostal like myself, doing taking the text about a witch. I'm a Pentecostal, at least an ex-Pentecostal. What is an ex-Pentecostal doing looking at a story about a witch? Pentecostals protect themselves from witchcraft. It is the Holy Ghost, the anointing of God. That is why you become Pentecostal, so that you might discern and be able to resist uh, the powers and the snares of witchcraft and of the devil. But that's why I'm preaching at the Katie Cannon Center for Womanist Leadership this morning and not at New Bethel, Mount Zion, Babylonian Baptist Church. Here, we can resist some things. We can query some things. We can probe some things. Here, we can do the ground bear, groundbreaking work, and we ought to be doing the groundbreaking work of retrieving stories and querying stories that, that the patriarchy had deemed for us as unacceptable, as ones we should stay away from. But as long as black women continue to find the Bible, the word of God, a word from God, life-giving, authoritative, inspiring, and holy, then we will need interpreters to help black women interpret stories and interpret stories that others claim to know better than we do. The witch of Endor has put a spell on me. She's been very upset that in all my 40 years, I have never preached about her. And so I had to woo her. I had to apologize to her. And she refused to let me to wander off to another story. But she did pout and she did chastise me. And now I'm here ready to preach from this very compelling and perhaps even complex text. Now, I only am supposed to have about 20 to 25 minutes. And so I, the, the text is a very lengthy text there in 1 Samuel 28. And I worried about whether I should read the entire story. But I, and I'm going to resist reading the entire story because I know you have your text. You have access to a Bible. You know how to Google the story and read it on your electronic devices. But it is there in 1 Samuel 28. And, and with the witch's permission, I really do have to at least read a few uh, verses just so that we might all get on board. I'm from that kind of tradition when it comes to preaching as opposed to uh, lecturing. And God knows right now, I'm not quite sure which one I'm, I'm doing. I, I, I know they've asked me to preach, but I feel a spirit of lecturing and teaching. But we'll see how this turns out in the end. But there in 1 Samuel uh, 28, you will find uh, this very curious and compelling and complicated story uh, in 1 Samuel 28 about Samuel, David, and a witch and death. Samuel, David, Saul, and a witch, and death. But in particular, 
want you to look with me at one particular verse. We're at verse 7 of 1 Samuel 28. Saul says to his attendants, go find me a woman who is a of a, a witch, a medium, a necromancer, so that I may go and consult with her, um, seek out her advice, tap into her skills. And they said to Saul, there is such a woman in Endor. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Who is this witch? And what is she to you? Ah, what is a good Pentecostal girl doing taking a story about a witch? If not to protect us against it, as, as not, if, if not to denounce it, after all, uh, all I know and have known about witches was I grew up watching Samantha on Bewitched. I grew up watching uh, The Wizard of Oz every year with Glenda the Good Witch in her white and, and her sister the Wicked Witch of the West, I believe, in her black. And I grew up. Well, I was much grown, but I enjoyed the story, the image, the movie Ghost starring Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze. <laughs> but it was, it was Whoopi Goldberg who nailed it with Oda Mae Brown and her medium talents and her medium-like talents, her talents for uh, uh, being a, an intermediary between life and death, her being a diviner. Yeah, a conjurer. What do I know about witches? Who is this witch that Saul says, go find me a woman, but just not any woman. Find me a of, the Hebrew word is of. Uh, what Pray tell does the story of the of OB or OB, depending on your transliteration. Uh, uh, what, what does this of, this, this woman, this woman with unusual powers, this, uh, this medium, what, what does she have to say to, to women? Women is who are gathered here at the Canon Center for Women's Leadership. Uh, this time, 30 years after the start of the woman is consultation, this important moment in history of a pandemic and, uh, 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 and the transition of administration and a black woman as the, as, uh, 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 as the vice president of the United States and, and women and black women especially being appointed to high places and, and, and doing great things across the country. Uh, Ah, uh, 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 but we but we cannot begin her story without uh, with the witch's permission, without setting some narrative framework so that you might appreciate when the witch walks in. That should have been the title. When the witch walks in, you must first understand the context in which she comes on the scene. Go find me a woman, a woman who is an of, who is a medium, who is a conjuring woman. Uh, the re unrelenting preoccupation of the narrative arc of the story is on the patriarchal and male-centric uh, 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 a framework from start to finish in the Deuteronomic narrative and the Deuteronomic uh, history itself, but especially here in First and Second Samuel. They are recognized around the careers of three men, Samuel, Saul, as I've said, and David. But women do play a large Larger, the larger role in second and Sam, second first and second Samuel than they do anywhere else in the Bible. It is a world where power is big 
becoming centralized, inherited, and hierarchical. It is a patriarchal world where men tend to dominate positions of public power in order to understand that when the witch walks in, you got to get the historical context and the social context. Ah, the books, the books of first and second Samuel, and through indeed the entire historical narrative of the Deuteronomic writer uh, is thick with Game of Thrones like power struggles, the rise and fall of powerful men, succession and rivalry, war and bloodbaths, political alliances and political blunders, friendships and betrayals, and the comings and goings of prophets and their power to prop up or topple down kingdoms. It is a world, says the witch, where men occupy the seats of authority, where power is passed down from father to son, from male to male, and where women bold enough to perform priest-like or prophet-like duties do so often on the periphery, on the margins of society. Go find me a woman who is a of a medium, a witch, a spiritist, a conjurer, he says. King Saul is on the eve of his defeat in, in a war with the Philistines and in a last minute throw, a Hail Mary throw, he, he commands his advisors to seek out a medium. He needs a, someone with, uh, with which who could help him communicate with the recently departed, deceased, a uh, uh, the last judge of Israel by the name of Samuel. Uh, Saul wants to talk to Samuel uh, in the hopes of shoring up his campaign, his, uh, uh, his, his kingdom, his rule as king. But Samuel is dead. And, uh, but no worries, no worries. He, he, Saul will consult a medium. Uh, uh, but, 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 but according to earlier in the passage, the chapter, he's already expelled. Um, in fact, he's already expelled all mediums expelled all witches, expelled all conjurers from the land. Ah, but there was one who still existed. There was still one who, who remained. There was always one uh, who was all, who, 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 who was able uh, to survive anyway. That, uh, let, come celebrate with me, Lucille Christmas said. Come celebrate me that every day something has tried to kill me, but I survived. Uh, every day there's a Saul somewhere who's trying to kill me, but I survived. There's always someone who is threatened by my powers and who's tried to destroy me and persecute me, uh, strike me down, but I survived. They, and they fail, says Lucille Clifton. And so the witch of Endor, the conjurer of Endor, uh, the medium of Endor, uh, uh, his attendant said, there is such a woman still surviving in Endor, wherever Endor is. Uh uh, we don't know the town, but we know the woman. She got larger. She was larger than her own village in which she lived. But everybody knew about the witch of Endor so that when King Saul needed a witch, needed a woman, everybody said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know that woman down the street? Yeah, she around the corner. Yeah, that little house down there. Yeah, man, don't nobody bother her. Oh, but there is, there is a woman there with powers to conjure up the prophet Samuel. Ah, uh, now listen, now listen. Ah, uh, uh, the story says that Saul disguised himself uh, because after all, nobody uh, would suspect him to be, to go to a witch's house, to go to a woman's house. Uh, uh, when he hears that there is such a woman who still exists, despite of his own decree earlier of expelling people with magical powers, uh, he hears uh, that she exists and he disguises himself and arrives at her door late at night, uh, uh, desperate for her help and conjuring up the spirit of Samuel, I tell you, so that he might have his reign legitimated against the powers of the Philistines. David and the Philistines have aligned themselves to wage war against Israel, and, and Saul is afraid 
that his kingdom is doomed. Now listen, it is a male story. It is a patriarchal story. It is an androcentric story. It is male uh, through and through. It is the story about men. It is the larger story, uh, the Game of Thrones-like story about male rivalry and, and male bid for power. Uh, and a hermeneutics of suspicion means that we must resist succumbing to the narrator's patriarchal narrative plot. Ah, uh, the story is a showdown between David and Saul in the hopes that Samuel would throw his support, his, his support behind Saul. The narrator has no soft spot in his heart for the, the, the so-called witch of Endor. She is minor. She is marginal. She is anonymous. We don't even know her name like so many other women in scripture, even here in Samuel. Her only reason for popping up in the story, given the historical context, is to show how desperate Saul is. David aligns himself with the Philistines. <laughs> Saul aligns himself with the witch. David aligns himself with the powerful Philistines. Saul, who is fated and doomed uh, to destruction, lines him, aligns himself up with a witch, a female witch, a woman from a small town. Uh, she is a fall. She is the brunt of a joke. She is not even the point. The narrator wants to show how far, far Saul has fallen that he needs a witch's help. Oh, but let me tell you sometimes, sometimes the best woman for the job is a witch. Yeah, who is that witch and what is, sometimes the best woman for the job, I will say it again, is a witch. She, uh, that, 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 that he, he calls not just for a woman. So I'll say, bring me somebody, a woman with power. Bring me a woman who traffics in magic brings me a woman who who knows things <laughs> bring me a woman who knows how how to conjure up something uh, I, I i don't need a professional a mourner i don't need a psalmist and psalmists are important and psalmists have a role to, and professional mourners have a but i'm not calling for a woman who is a judge i'm not calling for a woman like lydia who is a seller of purple but i need a witch i need somebody with power Ah, uh, and, and, and but now, now really, Saul did not have a problem with uh, uh with, with calling her a witch. It was, he that was not even about her being a witch. It was about her being a woman of power. But later interpreters would call uh, would would translate of as witch. Uh, uh, and we all know that witch the ne the term is is derogatory. It is ne it is negative. It is a pejorative. It it is it is intended to evoke fear and apprehension and disgust uh, ah, and negative feelings. It, it is a pejorative term that is used for strong women, womanish women, women who are uh, independent and, and have their own agency and women with power. She's called a witch by interpreters because a woman with this kind of power must be problematized. She must be demonized. But the word of in and of itself there in verse 3 and verse 9 and elsewhere, uh, it really means uh, it can be translated as a medium, as a spiritist, as someone who traffics in the world of ancestral spirits someone who knows how to conjure up ancestral spirits not someone who who not just a, a necromancer who traffics in dead things but someone who knows how to bring dead things back to life ha ah. ah she she doesn't go down to where samuel is she brings samuel up to talk to Saul oh i i want to go somewhere here today she knows Things she can bring dead things back to life. She's not a witch. She doesn't ride around on a broomstick. She doesn't have warts all over her face. This is not about uh, trying to demonize women and problematize women as uh, as being physically attractive and 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 But but this is about a woman and and, and her power. And we know uh, that patriarchy and, and we know uh, that patriarchy despises uh, womanish, headstrong. Power. 
powerful women who knows things and, and who has the power to bring dead things back to life. Only those afraid of powerful women dare speak of her as a witch. She is a medium. She is one who stands in between the past and the future. And she's the one who knows how to bring dead things back to life. She's a medium. She allows Samuel to be able to communicate with Saul and for Saul to be able, for, for life to be able to communicate with dead, for the ancestors to be able to communicate uh, with their descendants. She knows things. She knows how to do things. And she embodies patriarchal society's conflicting feelings about female power. It's fear of female power. It's desire to kill female power. It's desire to banish and suffocate female power. So she is a witch. <laughs> She's Kamala Harris but, uh, and, and, the, and the Texas uh, uh, Southern Baptist preacher. She's a Jezebel. She's a whore. She's a temptress. She is a seductress. These are the terms and more uh, uh, that, that are used to silence women, to marginalize not just women, but women's power. Women uh, who who, who have power in, in their garment, who has power, who knows things. We, black women, recognize uh, that, that, that and, we, and we intentionally are aware of our solidarity with women like the witch, the so-called witch of indoor. The witch of indoor, the witch, pejorative. Witch, throwing shade. Witch, that's just being nice, nasty. Witch, that's microaggression. The word which but is, is a powerful word in ancient culture intentionally to invoke fear and disgust and apprehension and ambivalence. Witchcraft is forbidden by the Deuteronomic uh, tradition there in the book of Deuteronomy and yet she comes and she survives Saul's edict and, 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 and every day something has tried to kill her but she survives. She is a medium. We, are, we intentionally are aligned and in solidarity with her. Sometimes the best woman for the child is a witch. We are in solidarity with her because we know what it is to be maligned and marginalized and mislabeled and forgotten until somebody needs our help and needs our assistance and our advice. Someone with their doomed campaign. We know how they cut us down and then they turn around and need us to save their presidency, save that. They, we don't get the gubernatorial bid. We don't win the, the governor's house there in Georgia, but then we turn around and save the democracy. We, we, we transgressive figures. Our women who embody power and independence and wisdom and self-possession. We know, we see you, Stacey Abrams. We see women like you. That Sometimes the best woman for the job is a witch. We, we have been taught. That's what the witch said to me. You've been taught to fear witches, but no one teaches you to fear those who burn witches alive. Our society has a problem with women with power, women who are unusual, women who, who knows things, women who stand outside in the periphery and the margin and intentionally and deliberately prefer to be outside on the, on the margins where they have their power and their knowledge, their secret knowledge. She's a medium. She is Miriam. She is Noadiah, Deborah, and Huldah. She is a prophet. She's a prophet. There is no difference between what she does and what other prophets do. So why is she called a witch? Elijah raises uh, the son of a woman, of the widow's son from the dead. No one calls him a witch He's a prophet. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. No one calls him a witch. He's a prophet like no other. She is a woman who has power. And she stands as a prophet because prophecy and divination are all on the same continuum. She is a prophet. She knows things. Sometimes in order to confront and live and survive in patriarchy, you're going to have to know how to bring dead things back to life. 
You are the one that they call to bring dead churches back to life. Sometimes the best woman for the job is a witch. You know how to bring dead situations back to life. Sometimes the best woman for the job is a witch. You know how to bring dead relationships, dead marriages, dead churches, dead organizations, dead schools and seminaries back to life because you are a witch and you know things. It means that you've got to not only know what you know, but you got to know what they don't know that you know. You got to know, you got to know evil even when evil doesn't know that you know. You got to know how to try the spirit by the spirit. You got to know things. You got to know how to conjure. Uh, you got to know how to sit in faculty meetings and just call on the spirit of God and bind the hand of the enemy. You got to know, you got to know that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You got to know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness in high places and powers of darkness. Oh, you got to know how to be a conjurer. And the witch knew Saul when he came and she knew it was a trap and she knew that there was danger, but she called Samuel up, Samuel up anyway because every day something has tried to kill me, but it's going to fail because I'm a witch like that. She's not only, let me rush on, she's not only a, a medium, I could stay there a long time. She's not only a witch who is a medium, and, and a, but she's also not only a medium, an intercessor. She's also a, a, a mouthpiece. That means she knows how to speak truth to power. She says to Saul, listen, you ask, you, I heard your voice, now you must hear my voice. I obeyed you and did what you wanted me to do. Now you must obey me and do what I need you to do. She does not uh, shrink back from this moment to speak truth to power. She doesn't, she's not intimidated by kings. She's, and even if she is intimidated by kings, she sucks it up and speaks to speaks truth to the power anyway. You got to sometimes cry and keep talking. Sometimes your voice is going to quake, a, 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 a waver and quaver, but you got to learn how to still speak truth to power. Sometimes you're nervous, your hands are sweaty, and maybe even there is water down your back because you're just that scared, but you're going to have to stand and speak truth to power. She is a mouthpiece. She's a poet. She's a prophet. She's a psalmist. She's a preacher. She's a rapper. Oh, she's a spoken word artist. She is a conjurer. She's a mouthpiece. She's a prophet. She knows how to speak truth to, to power. Oh, I love the words of Ella, uh, uh, Mother Ella Baker of, the, of, the, of SNCC, the grandmother of SNCC, uh, that that, that sweet honey in the rock uh, 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 um, immortalized her words. I'm a woman with a voice and I must be heard. And at times I can be quite difficult, Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy and Andrew Young. She was a pain in their backside. Uh, she says, at times I can be quite difficult because I'll bow to no man's word. Uh, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. So she is a, a mouthpiece. She will speak even when you don't want her to speak. She will get up and she will keep on speaking. Said uh, So Mitch McConnell will have to stand and say, listen, uh, she was warned. She was given an explanation. Nevertheless, that's right. Nevertheless, she persisted. Uh, uh, don't worry about being on the margins. Just keep on opening your mouth and speaking truth to power. Don't worry about living out and indoor. There is some protection about being out in the margins sometimes. Your gifts will make room for you. You don't have to go to King Saul. King Saul is going to come looking for you because he's going to need you before you need him. He may banish uh, others who are in your profession. He may demolish and, and, and cut back and cut down uh, others in your profession, uh, but he's going to need you. He may, he may indeed uh, try to disenfranchise you, but he's going to need you before you need him. You go, he's going to need you to save the democracy, and then he's going to invite your daughter to come and do the poem at his inauguration called Amanda Gorman. Ah, she is a mouthpiece, that witch. Who is that witch and what is she to you? She's a mouthpiece. She's a medium. And then finally, 
She's also not only a mouthpiece and a medium, but she's got magic. Uh, or she's she's got magic. Listen, let me tell you. Uh, 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 she 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 is. She says, listen. I I, I spoke to you. I, I heard you. Now you're gonna have to meet me, and you're gonna have to speak to me. And you're gonna have to listen to me. Let me go back to that point about the mouthpiece one more time because I forgot something. I'm standing now in the tradition of garden to tell of you. Sometimes you gotta back up in your sermon. Uh, when you realize maybe you've forgotten something. And, and it's, uh, uh, Dolores Williams says, sometimes that uh, you got to look and say, whose voices are missing around the table? Yeah, that, that, I, I'm not the only mouthpiece. I'm standing here as the witch of indoor, but I'm standing here in the tradition oh, oh, of the, uh, oh, you're going to meet the witch of Tekoa and the witch of Abel. I'm, I'm standing here in the, in the tradition of other women whose voices, the daughters of Shiloh. I'm here standing in the tradition of, of Hannah and Abigail. I'm standing here in the tradition of, of other women uh, whose voices may not be heard. And so you force, you heard my, I heard your voice. Now you hear my voice. I love when she says that to the king. She said, you forced us to study and be tested on the knowledge of Whitehead and Tillich and Von Rott and Martin Note and Niebuhr and Bootman and Bart and Butch, Buttrick. But now you will have to learn our tradition. I heard yours. I've learned yours. I've mastered yours. But once we get into these academies and once we get into these guilds, now you're going to learn our canon. Our woman is canon. You're going to learn the black women's intellectual tradition. We're going to write our dissertation. We're going to footnote. We're going to write our books about Anna Julia Cooper. You're going to have, I heard your voice. I've learned Mark, uh, uh, Tillich and Whitehead and Niebuhr and Bootman and Bart. Ah, uh, but you're going to have to learn Zora Neale Hurston and you're going to have to learn Polly Murray and know about Prathia Hall. We're going to write our dissertations. We're going to talk about womanist epistemology. We're going to talk about womanist ethics and and we're going to talk about woman as pastoral care. We're going to do woman as theology. And we're going to quote from Morrison's uh, uh, beloved. And we're going to quote, ah, uh, yes, from Ella Pearson Mitchell and, and pray Thea Hall win. And, and, and you're going to, we heard your voice. Now you're going to have to hear our voices. And she knows things. She is a mouthpiece. She is a medium. And finally, she is a woman who knows. Mm. Sometimes the best woman for a job is a woman who knows magic. Sometimes the best woman for the job is not only a medium, not only a mouthpiece, but she knows magic. She knows she has power in her hem of her garment. She has she comes and she can change the atmosphere. She walks in and she knows how to bring dead things back to life. She comes in and she speaks and no dog barks. She speaks with power and authority. Ah, she is a woman with magic. And when she walks by, people say, who is that woman? And what is she to you? Ah, she, she, she recognizes the, the, the traps of Saul. Ah, but she knows how to put a until you do right by me kind of spell. I'm talking about lady wisdom. I'm talking about women with a second eye. I'm talking about women who have apprenticed themselves, Melanie Jones, with women who know things. I'm talking about women who not only are here for the nice nails and the nice uh, stilettos and the cute, ah, oh, we've got you to be womanist, and if that's where you want to roll, go ahead and roll, but, but do you have any magic? I, you look good, nice, like some nice lipstick. Girl, you got, you rocking that blonde, you rocking that, uh, 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 that kind of purple hair, but baby, do you have any, do you, do, and Big Mama said, do you got any power, honey? I, 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 do you have some power to bring dead things back to life? You look good, but you, but do you have any power? I mean, what, give, show me your, what, what your, what, give me your street credits. Can, can, can you change the atmosphere? Do you, do you know how to stop the mouths of lions? Do you know how to put your enemies under your feet? Do you know how to sit and pray a spell on somebody? Do you know how to call up the ancestors? Do you know how to call the, the women 
of the, of the coven together and call them to bring down heaven and earth. Do, do you have the word of God in your mouth? Can you speak dead things back to life? I'm talking about she knows magic. She is got a second eye. She sees way down the road. She go call one of those women of the church who walks in the church and folks sit up. Go call one of those women who walks in the church and even the pastor has to live in, has to listen. She knows things. She knows magic. She brings life uh, in the women's prayer circle. She's like what uh, Bill Wilder says, grandma's hand sue the local unwed mother. She said, baby, grandma understands that you really love that man, but put yourself in Jesus' hand. I'm talking about grandma's hands. Go find a woman who is on speaking terms with God and got a little prayer wheel turning and know a little fire is burning and just a little talk with Jesus will make it right. Yeah, she's a mouthpiece and yeah, she's a medium, but baby, does she have any magic? Does she know how to put a spell on wayward husbands and hard-headed children? Does she know how to pray the enemy out of her house? I'm talking about herbalists. I'm talking about homopathic goddesses. I'm talking about women who know how to go out into the yard and know what 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 is poke salad and and what will help bring out the bring the fever down and know how to work with uh, black root and and other herbs and boil a brew and and know how to uh, put a poultice on your chest. I'm talking about medicine that was the secret of our great grandmothers and patriarchal medicine stole it and turn and 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 call them and label them witches because of their power and they would not surrender that secret knowing that they had. I'm talking about women who knew how to take care of stomach aches and stomach cramps and, uh, and, and menstrual pain. I'm talking about where is your magic? Do you have any power? Do you always need to go buy some, but do you know how to conjure up anything? Go find, who is this witch? Go find, go find me a woman like Henry Etta Lackey, whose cancer cells had power to bring dead things back to life. Who are, whose cancer cells are the source of the Gila cell line, the first immortalized human cell line and one of the most important cell lines in medical. Go find me a witch by the name of Henry Ella Lackey. Go find me Harriet Tubman uh, who was hit over the head and was blooded. But when she woke up, she rose up in defiance who, who saw her way to freedom and went back down into slavery uh, uh, on the Underground Railroad and rescue 300 people in 19 trips. Go find me a woman uh, who is a witch, a woman with magical powers, who know how to go into a dirt yard and turn it into the Garden of Eden, who knows how to turn dirt into roses and sunflowers and black-eyed Susans and, and da dahlia, dahlias and petunias and forsythia. In search of our mother's gardens who can turn shanty neighborhoods into a bed of her garden. Go find me the priestess of the queen of heaven. Go find me somebody with the powers of Orisha and Santeria and the Voodoo and the Obia queen. Go find me a woman like this man, a woman uh, who knows things, who knows how uh, to conduct deliverance service. Go to find me the women who would tell you there at, uh, at, at the morning's bridge. Baby, keep on calling Jesus. Call his name. Call his name. Call his name, baby. No, that ain't it. Come on. Come on and call his name. He'll, he'll call him up. Call him up. He'll, he'll make everything. I bind you in the name. Call, call the women who got magic. I know you got a degree, but do you have any magic? I know you got your masters, but do you have it? You don't need a degree. You need magic. Ah, you don't need what you think you need. You need power. Go find me a woman. Even if she's demonized and problematized and ostracized, go find me a woman who knows that even if she's called Jezebel and whore and reprobate and sorcerer and conjurer and witch, she knows she got power to bring dead things back to life. She's a womanist like that. Go find me a woman who is a witch, a medium, a mouthpiece, and a woman with magic. Sometimes the best woman for the job is a witch who traffics in the world 
of the Spirit. Who knows how to try the Spirit by the Spirit. Who knows that God is a Spirit. And they that worship God and the goddesses must worship in Spirit and in truth. But do you have any power? You've, you've got a mouth. But do you have power to call dead things back to life? Go find me a witch, a woman who traffics in ancestral things and can cause the spirit of our ancestors the women of the witch's calling to come at her command and say, Satan, we're going to tear your kingdom down. You've been building your kingdom all over this land. But me and my womanist witches, we're going to tear your kingdom down.